Take our seats, please. We'll be in the book of Galatians. We're starting the book of Galatians. We're going to go through verse by verse for the next several weeks. Uh, I feel like we're missing an announcement. <clears throat> Oh, it's our anniversary, yeah, this coming uh, Wednesday. Oh. Of course, I know all about it, sweetheart. 31, 31 long. Torture, no, no, it's been great. I don't know of a better marriage out there, I really don't, really. The day she married me was the greatest day of her life, and uh, that's the secret. What's that? Oh, Maureen Von Lubin has a birthday today, but she's not here, is she? Where is she? Yeah. <laughs> Great God Almighty, free at last. <laughs> I'm texting her right now. Huh, getting fit, are you? All right, so we're in Galatians, okay? This was written probably late 40 AD, early 50s AD. Paul is writing to a series of churches in a region, it's a Roman province where, where we now know it as Turkey, it's central, southern Turkey, some of the, it's several churches, it's not like a city or one church. You've got Iconium, Lystra, uh, Derby, uh, Antioch, it's like six or seven church, Dundalk, uh, it's a bunch of churches and uh, <clears throat> So he's going to write them now, and they're falling into legalism. The uh, Jewish brethren from Jerusalem were coming down. They were trying to make the Gentiles there more Jewish to be closer to God. It's always a problem in the church, some kind of legalism. It pops up its head uh, here and there. Uh, Tertullian was one of the great church fathers, but he embraced, he, he was real hard on uh, perfumes and uh, jewelry and stuff like that. He said, if God wanted you to smell like a flower, he'd planted a, a plant on top of your head, you know, an otherwise brilliant guy. But I mean, these things happen. And so he's writing and he's saying, what are you crazy? It's about grace. I portrayed Christ crucified before. Don't let these men do this to you. And it happens all the time. I know some of you have come from abusive churches. And legalism is almost at the very center of it, almost always. And what that is, is a power play. It's a way that you can convince people that you're more moral than them, that you're more substantial uh, to be listened to. And, uh, you know, so nothing wrong with homeschooling, but you have to homeschool. Uh, you want to get rid of your TV? Fine, get rid of your TV, but don't make everybody else feel like they got to get rid of their TV. I like to dress in women's clothing. Well, we better stop that. But let's just move on here. Let's, let's look at what it says. Uh, Paul, verse 1, Galatians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, it means sent one not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. It's a salutation. That's uh, it's, who is it from? Where, uh, who is it to? And what's it all about? How high do you do? That's an ancient letter. Uh, he's saying that I didn't come up with this, that the gospel didn't come from Paul's head. It came from God's heart. I didn't get it from men. I'm not secondhand from the apostles. This is straight from God. You'll read later, he went to Arabia for like three years, and Jesus appeared to him, uh, 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 indoctrinated him, and so he's claiming authority above that of even the angels. Because he said in 2 Corinthians, he said, even if, an, you know, that angels turn themselves into the, the messengers of Satan, the ministers of Satan turn themselves into to angels of light. And he's going to say in here, if, if I or, or even an angel says something, this gospel I'm giving to you is higher than angels. It's coming straight from God. And he'll say that in this chapter. So get the feel of what's going on here. They're trying to get uh, people circumcised. And you can imagine, you go into church, you know, it's joy. Oh, I'm saved by grace. You're a man. By the way, you need to get circumcised. I go look for another church down the road. Verse 3, grace to you and peace. There is no peace without grace. You've heard that a million times. From God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father, 
to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are turning away so soon for him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert, to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And he's going to say this twice. He's saying damned. If you decide to add to the gospel, you're damned. You see, belief, what you believe is everything. They said, Jesus, what do we do to do the works of God? He said, believe in him who, who, who God sent. Believe me. I want to be believed. It's a matter of heaven and hell, you know. And so the objective of Christ's death here, he's saying, is that he might deliver us from this present evil world. And you see, the world is under condemnation. Uh, Paul's world was brutal. 60% of the population were enslaved. A slave at that, in that day would be chained to the master's door at night and sleep down in a hole under the steps uh, for entertainment to worship their gods. They would have gladiatorial entertainment. Men would kill one another and they would s throw food up into the stands. And it was a brutal world. It was an evil world. And they believed me. They knew the world was not their friend. The question is, do we? Do we know that this world is as evil as that world? Because it is, if not more so with the infanticide that's taking place in our country and through abortion and all these things. But, but how did he deliver us, he says? And he says that he delivered us by giving himself. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God gave himself. God gave us not only his throne, but he gave up his clothes. He was naked on the cross. He gave up his reputation. He gave his back to the smiters. He gave his cheeks to those who pluck out the beard and his hands and feet to the nails and his head to the thorns. And he gave his body, soul, and spirit. God gave himself. And so we are called to give ourselves back, not just one day a week, but a life that says, thank you, God, that you've bled your life out for mine. And what did he give himself for? He gave himself for my sins. Bad business deal. But that's what God has done. Why did he do this? Look at what he says. According to the good pleasure of God the Father. It gave God the Father great pleasure to pour his wrath out on his son instead of you. Now, I don't understand it. But that's the gospel. The gospel is not, yeah, I believe in Jesus and now I need to speak in tongues. Well, I believe in Jesus, now I need to pray 80 hours a day. That's bad math, I know, but you get the idea. And he says, it's God's will to set you apart from this evil world, to be unlike this world, to not think like this world, to not believe like this world, you see, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. So what he's saying is, this is a glory that will last forever. This is not fading glory. This is not man's applause. This is not an Olympic gold medal. This is endless, undiminishing radiance, just, just splendor and glory and majesty for all, you see. And, and so, you know, the, and then he says amen, which means absolutely true. This is unshakably true. This present evil age, and you know, in our culture, you know, when you, I've been doing a lot of studying on this. In our culture, we have now come to the point where we see it as more evil as a society to judge evil than to do evil. It's amazing, but it's like tolerance, and tolerance has gone so far that you're worse if you judge evil behavior than doing the evil behavior. And God warns us about these things all throughout the Bible. And for God to deal with the evil in the world, what is the source of the evil in this world? You and me. It is the wicked heart of mankind, the depravity of mankind. And so for God to deliver us from this present evil age, he needs to deliver the evil within you and me. Our hearts are the problem. It's the life issue. False teaching destroys people. It sends people to hell. It destroys the soul. You know, after 70 years of communism, the voice is raised up, and the Russians said, atheism has destroyed the soul of our nation. We have no reason to be honest. We don't have any reason to not steal, to, to, not, to, to live sacrificially. It's destroyed our souls. Teach us how religion can help us restore our souls. You see, what happens is, is our souls need to catch up with our ideas and our activities. 
And so what you're doing here now is you're restoring your soul. You're resting your soul. You're lying your soul down in green pastures behind still, be beside still meadows. You've come here to lie down in the word of God and let your soul absorb the nutrients and just go, ah, this is, this is what life is about. We have to catch up. And God gives you a call and it's a disturbance of your daily routine. It's an interruption. It's God calling us home. That's why we come here and we sing and we cry, we cry because we're homesick. We hear from home and we know how life could be and it's not that way and how our relationships could be and it's not that way. And so we weep when we sing of home. You see, feed your soul. Keep it strong. Just don't, don't come here and just listen to me. Read the Bible. Study it for yourselves. There's a lot of good teaching out there, but nothing will bless you more than you sitting down and saying, God, feed my soul. Please teach me how you feel. Show me what I am and what I am not. Burn away the delusions I have about myself. I, I know I'm trying to protect my noble character with character armor. I'm trying to prove that I'm heroic by being religious or flying planes into buildings. And so Paul will twice say, let them be damned if they teach you something else. Unbelief is evil, we're told. Now see, what we live in today, and you're going to hear this term a lot, and I just want to take a little time to feed you with this, because this is the culture you live in. It's called a post-modern society. And you'll hear this a lot, and it's hard to pin down exactly what the philosophy is, but that's what you're watching all over the news today with all the protests and all the marches and all the social justice warriors and all the stuff that's out there. I need a safe space for this. I need a safe space from that. I need a safe space from people like that. And you have this generation of whining and they, they, they don't really understand what's motivating them. It's a post-truth culture. As my son Joshua taught a couple weeks ago, increasingly invading the social sciences and humanities in your universities. Your universities are be quickly becoming snake pits of disastrous ideas. Uh, Nietzsche said that everybody is the unconscious expression of a dead philosopher. They don't even know what has them in their grip. You see, and, but then the mob becomes this, this, this mouthpiece of dissatisfaction and, and protest, but they're not even sure what's driving it. You see, for it's some kind of particu uh, particular doctrine. And you can't underestimate uh, the power of ideas apart from the sovereignty of God. That's what we're looking at. And so what they do is they reject any Western civilization culture. And so now they're beginning to embrace hyper-socialism and communism and Marxism and all these things, equity for all. Let me tell you, with all the problems that capitalism has, and it has problems, and we are a capitalist society, we all want to take care of the poor. We all want even distribution of, of, uh, of uh, finances and so forth. But if you were to take the collective poor of America, and just make them a country, they would be the 18th most prosperous nation in the world. So for all the faults that our country has and, and, and its systems and ideas have, there's a lot to be thankful for. And when you have a thankless society, this is what you get. You get bitterness, and you get aggression, and you get rebellion. And you see, we all want to work for equality for all, but, you, you, you know, we should be grateful. But there's not a shred of gratitude anywhere within this movement, you see, and so it's driven by deceit and arrogance, and, and this is what you're dealing with, you know. It, it, you'll see them say, fight capitalism, but how are they getting their message out there? Through capitalism. They're doing it through the Internet. They're doing it through iPhones. They're doing it through every... Those things wouldn't exist without the way the Western civilization has developed and, and evolved technologically, you see. So you just have this insanity going place. Now, here's something else I want you to understand. When you deal with people with this mindset, you, they, they can't be reasoned with. They don't even believe in reason. They believe that logic keeps people down. They don't believe in the individual or the logos, which is the logic, that it just keeps the oppressed oppressed. 
You have to understand. So when you're talking to these people, you can, my son was sharing this with me. For instance, when they come at you and they talk about morality and these things, they, they don't want to be reasoned. They don't want facts, but you tell them, you know, what you're teaching is immoral because this kills babies. Because they begin to convince themselves that they're more moral than you because they know they're under the judgment of God, so they've got to prove they're more moral than you right-wing conservatives. And it might be very subtle, but it is Marxism coming back disguised in something else, you see? And, and, and it's why they don't let people who disagree with them speak on college campuses. Um, you're either part of the bourgeois, middle-class, materialistic party or the proletariat, the working class. So it's this class distinction, and it creates this tension within the society, you see? It's post-Marxist thought, you see? But everywhere post-Marxism uh, Marxism was tried up until the 70s was led to murder and oppression and poverty. That's what's happening in our country today. I want to tell you that freedom of speech is a divine thing. Freedom of speech was given by God who is the word, who is the spoken word, who said speech is there to give truth, not spin. Truth that frees. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So here's the thing. Paul is dealing with this church that has false views of grace, false views of religion. And the point is, is man has a hard time embracing grace because it's so otherworldly. There's always an echo in the back of your soul that says, ah, but it doesn't work for you. Yeah, you know who you are. I know who you are. I know what you did last summer. And so the Christian life, the Christian life is trusting in somebody else's goodness. The Christian life is trusting in God's goodness, God's life, God's obedience. He obeyed everything to the T. And every other religion is advice that you just can't live up to. And so it frees you to admit your failures and your weaknesses. You know, Adam was the first Pharisee trusting in himself. And then, of course, it becomes a power play. God comes along. What did you do? Wasn't my fault. It was her. I'm good. I named all the animals, did what she told me to do. And you gave her to me, so it's either you or the woman. I'm fine. That's a Pharisee. It's the elder brother and the prodigal son, you see. And so, as we look at these things here, you'll see more and more that pride is the demand that people make much out of you. Oh, and it comes into the church. You should see people over the years, 32 years now I've been doing this ministry, 32 years, and uh, of course I had uh, my custodian, Bob, he's passed away since then, but said, Rick, I've seen so many people fight over the microphone, but never has anybody come and fought over my mom. And it's just the way it is. You see, it's just the way that it is. And so here, these Judaizers are trying to make a big deal out of themselves. You need to be more like me. And Paul, in the book of Acts, verse 20, says to the elders there that, that this whole Bible is the word of grace. Grow in grace. Grow in the fact that you're more terrible than you ever imagined, but more loved and forgiven than you can ever imagine. And that frees you to be who you are. You can come in here and say, you know, I hate your guts, you're ugly, but uh, that doesn't work. So, but you can come in and say, you know, I've just, I've struggled this week, I've blown it. C.S. Lewis says this, he says, to talk about man's search for God is like talking about the mouse's search for the cat. Man does not search for the real God. He searches for a generic God, not a specific God, because it leaves the, the parameters wide, wide open to think or do whatever you want to do. And see, he says that God approaches you at inconceivable speed, and that there is one place where the speed, one place in the universe where we can come uh, with not what we offer to God, but what God has to offer us, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. It is an ancient, stooping love that places value on the object that loves, not because the object has intrinsic value in and of itself, he comes to animated dust and gives us the value of being a son of God. 
you see, and it's a love that transcends. This is the eternally present God. And of course, you know, we saw before communion that, that God transcends time and makes it all worthwhile, you see. But you see, as we look at these things, uh, it, you know, God says, take your little story, put it in my big story. That's why you're a storyteller. And isn't it interesting, we just talked about communion where God said, now when you drink of this, bread, drink of this wine and eat this bread, now, remember me? When he broke the bread, that's what he said. Remember on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24? Jesus comes up to these guys, two guys, and he starts to witness to them. He teaches the whole Old Testament. And then they finally, he calls them aside and said, hey, they didn't, they didn't recognize him until he broke the bread. All of a sudden, they recognized him. You see, so God uses communion in very, very particular ways. It's very cool. Uh, God says uh, in chapter 59, verse 10, I think it's David says, the God of mercy goes before you that God's mercy runs far ahead of you long before, uh, for before the time he mercied you with eternal life. Listen, you didn't choose God. God chose you. Jesus told the disciples, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I chose you before time. I chose you before you didn't exist, except as a thought in my mind. You wouldn't exist if I didn't say, Rick Plant, hope be. You wouldn't even exist. That's when I chose you. And you see what happens is, and, and, and this is one thing I've learned in 32 years of being a pastor, that God prepares the preacher for the people for that time and that place. And he works on the other end preparing the people for the preacher for this time and this place. So whenever you go into a church, whether it's here or whatever, and you go, he was talking to me. Yeah, he was. And he's working on you all your life to, for that vantage point for the two creatures in his hands that he has shaped, and boom, there's a hookup. And he prepares us, and he mercies us. You see, what happened is God prepared Paul for, for such a time as this, you see. He got him ready, and he just, you know, Paul, remember, Paul was a great intellect. He was brilliant and he was driven to, to expound the right thing. And, and, and it's just like if you walked into a, a machine shop and you saw, saw a mold and somebody's pouring the lead into the mold and you can see, well, this is going to be a gear or this is going to be a wheel. And you watch God make a man like Paul and he's like insanely in, intelligent and he can expound the, the heart of the matter so well. And, and it's like, what's he going to do? And there is the, 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 the pot, the pottery there at the, at the master's feet feet and it's like what is this going to be well this is going to be a man who is highly educated in the Jewish law he's also been given an understanding of the Greco-Roman culture and at the right time in the right place God said now you will paint the beauty of my gospel to this culture and you're going to do it in Greek Koine Greek which is very specific very scientific language so it can very well express my heart to the people. Now, here's the thing. Paul was like, are you nuts? Paul started this church. He said, I, I showed you Jesus. What are you doing? New Christians, I have found, and it's understandable, they don't have much discernment. They haven't had time to train themselves in what, you know, all the things that come with Christianity and the world and life. And so it's kind of like, you know, I heard one pastor telling a story. He said, now, now, honey, I don't want you to talk to bad men. And the kid said, well, I know what a bad man looks like. And the father said, what? And he goes, eh, like <laughs> the face. And that's what happens with Christians. Oh, he seems like a nice guy. Well, he said the word Jesus. And the whole time, it's a, it's a con artist. Because the guy's just after money or whatever. And so Paul's going to say, either if we are an angel from heaven. See, let me just read this for you. He says, 
verse 7, which is not another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. You see, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. You see, and this is what he's saying. He's saying, it's everything. What you believe is everything. It's not as long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter. No, God doesn't say that anywhere. And this is where God specifically says, I don't care what your experiences are. I don't care if you had a vision. I don't care if you saw a statue cry or a statue bleed. It means nothing if it's contradictory to God's holy scripture. And so don't go on these stories, and how many stories do we need to hear of some kid who went to heaven? And come, that turned out to be a big lie. The more recent one, when I went to heaven or whatever the whole thing was, it was just a hoax. And everybody runs around like we needed some story to believe in what we know we believe. We don't need all that going on. You know, it was Joseph Smith, uh, the angel Moroni came to him. That's where the cult started. You go with the Mormons, they're going to teach you, every one of you ladies in the, in the afterlife, you're going to have your own planet and be eternally pregnant. And it's, no, <laughs> and, and it's no wonder that the highest suicide rate in the country is in Utah, the heartbeat of Mormonism. Now, I don't know if that correlates any, but I got a pretty good idea it does. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So here it is, he's saying this, look, the gospel is not man-made. The gospel is an insult to man. He would never come up with it. Puts man in the dust. You see, anything that diminishes the all-sufficiency of the cross is evil. That's what he's saying here. There's no other gospel. And this, by the way, was the is the book that launched the Reformation, which this year is its 500th year anniversary. It charged it up. And here is Paul saying, cursed is anyone who leads anyone away from the gospel which removes the curse. This is what he's saying. Now look at this in verse um, 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I never received it from man, nor was I taught, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it, destroy it. And I have advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Now look at this. This is very key. But it, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to, to Peter, to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him for 15 days. And I saw none other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you indeed, before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went to the regions of Syria, Cilicia, and was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only that he who formerly persecutes us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. You see what he's saying? They're challenging his apostleship. They're challenging his authority because these false teachers have come down and say, we've come directly from Peter. We've come directly from these big shots. Paul's nothing. He doesn't even know those guys. Paul said, I didn't even go to them. I went to Jesus. Jesus taught me. And then afterwards, I went to talk to these guys. That's my authority is what he's saying. So imagine God. And he chooses Paul. And he watches this maniac ride all over town and in prison and torture and persecute and kill, even kill Christians. Why? Because when he becomes converted, there's no other explanation than the power of God and the grace of God to the most ill-deserving. And then after he gives them his sight back, he says, I got to show you how much you got to suffer for me. It's going to be tough. 
you see, but it's inexplicable, inexplicable from a human standpoint. The whole idea of the electing grace of God, of God just saying, you, you're going to be saved. You're going to be my child. I don't understand how to reconcile that with free will. That's there as well. But it's what God does. And so Paul went to Arabia for three years. He was schooled apparently by Jesus himself. Go later on, Galatians will say, who's bewitched you? You're cut off from Christ. And so two things are at stake when the gospel is perverted, the glory of God and the salvation of souls. And those are the only two things that matter because they're the only two things that are eternal, God and the human soul. And that what you believe determines where that soul is going to go, with God or without God, cursed or uncursed. And so Paul, he says, I didn't seek to please men. Men don't like this message. And what he's saying here is essentially this. He's saying this. He's saying, when you live to please one person, Jesus Christ, everything is integrated because all travels toward that point. When you try to please everybody, you're disintegrated. You're trying to be everything to everybody else. You can't go wrong when you please God. So you please God and let God take care of the men who like you or dislike you, and you'll find more and more as you grow in the Lord. You don't care what people think of you. You care what God thinks of you. So I get to say whatever I want to say, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. <laughs> but you see what he's saying? Paul was talking about himself. He's talking about the Corinthians, talking about himself. And then verse 15, he says, but when God, he changes the subject. The subject all all, all of a sudden is now, but God. We have this mess, but God. And Paul becomes the object of God's grace. Listen, Christianity is not something you take up. It takes you up. Christianity is something that happens to you. And then the fruit of that rooting in Christ just naturally grows out, you see. You were decided upon. It's some, Christianity is something God has done to you. And all you can do is stand under that, that glory and just drink it in and show the world your gratitude for his great, great love for you. And this is what theologians call preceding grace or prevenient grace that Paul's election took place in the womb. He's look, he set me apart in the womb by divine will. Why? Because it pleased God. The purpose of preceding grace, you see, is that God made you out of dust and intended you for a purpose. And beneath the maker's hand, he made you what he wanted to make you. And the purpose of preceding grace is this, that your entire destination cannot be compromised because it's God's will. God has decided upon you. God has decided he's going to take you home. And you will persevere in that faith, you see. And so, uh, just like Paul, you and I have that calling. It's very specific. Uh, You know, God has a purpose for these things uh, to pursue, you know, uh, so, so that he can use you in such a way. Now, listen, Romans 8, chapter 29 tells us this that um, God loves, uh, everything work, works together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. You're called according to his purpose. That means you can't fail. It's his purpose to get you into heaven. It's his divine purpose. And God's will is to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. Man never walks towards God without God making it happen. There is no holiness of our own creation. Listen, here's the thing. All right, you want to be conformed in the image of Jesus. That means this. To the Jesus who was slandered, who was persecuted, who was lied about, who was beaten, who was tortured, who was completely just hated by this world, will you open your hands up and bear those scars? Because that's the image that is the good that God is working together for, for you to be like Christ. And you know, you start to look at things like that and go, well, maybe I don't want to be too dedicated, (laughs) you know? But to be a man or a woman as God intended, 
that the same power that created Jesus in Mary's womb is the same power creating Jesus in your soul. And isn't it strange that God would build a temple to live in forever made out of dust? Because that's what we are. And you know, here's the thing. Our inability to be like him, our inability as we look at the one who willingly died for his enemies, we look at that, we, we, we look at that, that, that Christ on that cross and realize our inability to achieve that on our own, and yet that is the same vision. That is the same vision that transforms you from glory to greater glory. Second Corinthians chapter 3, as we look into the face of Jesus Christ, we are transformed from glory to greater glory. I look at Jesus and go, this is, this is so far above me. The very fact that you want to be like him is proof that you're on your way. Go up to somebody on the street and say, would you like to be crucified? No, I don't think so. How can that be sovereignly, supernaturally put as a desire into a human being's heart? Only God can do. The purpose of predestination, of prevenient grace, of preceding grace, is for us to rest in it. So we've come here today to lie our souls down in green pastures, to let our souls catch up with life. And because of this, nothing is left to chance or change or God's fickleness or my fickleness or your failures or your weakness because it is God's good will to make you like himself and take you home. Don't let anybody take you away from the pure, sheer gospel of grace and mercy because once you add something to that, you've knocked the entire thing out of focus because there is no peace in Jesus and me doing this. There's no peace in that and there's no truth in it and you just diminish his great love. Let's have the worship team come up here. And so, Father, we step again in a special way into your presence. We want to magnify you. We want to glorify you, Lord. We want to, we want to just bow our hearts before you. I pray if anyone here doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior, that they would get to know him now, that they would surrender their hearts to him, that they would know his deep, deep love for them and desire for them. We're going to sing two songs, and the, there are going to be two folks by the double doors here. If you need prayer, you can get up during the first song and come down, and they'll pray with you. The ushers are going to come down, and they're going to take up a collection. And so, Lord, we pray for generous hearts overflowing and giving to extend your gospel, to reach the lost in this world. We want to be used that way. In Jesus' name, let's worship.